Everyone, I am Pete Davis. I am one of the co-founders of the Democracy Policy Network. We're an organization that tries to raise up ideas for deepening democracy. We mean democracy in the broadest sense of the term, anything that extends more power to more people in more ways. We're focused at the state level, but these ideas are relevant to the city level and federal level as well. There are two main things we do. We write up policy kits about promising ideas for deepening democracy, and we hold briefings like this today with cool experts and cool state leaders like yourself. Today, I'm really, really, really excited about this briefing because it's coming out of a kit that has been in the works for a year. Um, Deep and organizer Mark Histed has worked on an amazing kit on this interesting model for public funding of journalism called Local News Dollars. It's inspired by Seattle's Democracy Dollars campaign finance reform system, and it is one of many promising uh, policies for helping preserve and expand and deepen uh, local journalism, which is one of the bedrocks of democracy. Today, we have senior economist at the Center for Economic and Policy Research, Dean Baker, joining us. We have media and democracy program manager at California Common Cause, who's been influential in California debates on public funding of journalism, Maya Chupkov. We have a journalist himself. We didn't want to just be wonks talking about journalism. We wanted a journalist uh, and journalist lead, journalism leader himself. Uh, Marcus Green, who is the publisher of the South Seattle Emerald and a columnist with the Seattle Times. And kicking us off today is Mark Histed from the Democracy Policy Network's uh, local news dollars kit. I'm going to throw it to Mark in uh, 30 seconds. But first, I just want to say, if you have any questions as this event goes on, drop them in the chat. We're going to have a QA and a after each of the speakers give their opening statements. We'll kick it off with Mark laying out an overview of the idea. Then we'll go to Maya, Marcus, and Dean giving their own perspectives on public funding for journalism and how this idea, uh, their reflections on this idea too. So over to you, Mark, to kick this off. Great. Um, Thanks, Pete. And thanks everyone who's here. And and I just want to say I'm really excited about the the, the whole group that's here, including the the experts who have taken their time to uh, join us today. Um, this idea builds a lot on other, you know, on, on prior work that that people have done on funding uh, news with public dollars. So we are all here today because we think democracies depend on a strong and free press, um, and we think that the decline of local newsrooms is a danger for democracy, and that's because. Um, Journalism uh, informs the way it informs voters' choices and informs the way voters uh, make decisions in a democratic society. And you know, there's so many ways that uh, journalism influences public debate. And just to cite one example uh, from recent days, uh, the nonprofit newsroom ProPublica recently published a big investigation on the courts that has really driven a lot of discussion <laughs> in the public debate and in the press over the past few weeks. Um, second, I think, you know, local journalism is the foundation of an informed public. It, a lot of stories that happen in the national press, which we are, which come to our attention, originated in local newsrooms, often broken in local newsrooms by local reporters. And this is something that's also been uh, in the news lately, has risen to the top of our public discussion. Um, just a few days ago at the White House Correspondents Dinner, the, head, the keynote, the headliner, um, Roy Wood, talked about the dangers, uh, the decline of local journalism, how dangerous that was for democracy. And he said, um, many of the nas- most of the national stories in this country were first local stories. And he also said, if we can't find a way to pay local reporters in this country, um, where is, you know, the implication is where is democracy going to go? So um, we're here today to talk about why it's hard to pay local reporters and how to fix that. One reason why it's hard to pay local reporters is that journalism, and this is, I think, kind of, this is relatively under-discussed, is that journalism is a public good, um, which means effectively that the benefits that we derive from journalism as a society um, are large, but the incentives for individuals to pay for journalism um, are relatively smaller. So you know, individual, you know, we may all, our democracy may benefit from the journalism that happens, but individuals may, uh, in in many cases, do not have strong incentives to pay lots of money to, um, to journalism outlets. 
meaning that markets alone do not support the kind of journalism that democracy needs. A second concept is that uh, news is not only a public good, but also an information good, as economists like Julia Kaje have written about. Uh, and there's lots of discussion about this in the economics literature, where um, the, um, the benefit that derives, that you might derive from an article, uh, a journalism article, or consuming journalism content, um, you may not be able to assess until you've actually watched or read the article, watched the news content, read the article. And at that time, you've already acquired its value. And so this kind of thing also breaks market pricing mechanisms. And so I just want to underline here, you know, there's been a lot of discussion in the past um, few years, past few decades, that oh, it's, it's almost framed as consumers just decided to stop paying for news, to choose entertainment over news. But that's not really the case. In many cases, the issue is that markets fail news. And this is something we have to figure out different news funding models. Okay, which leads me to the, the local news funding proposal we are all here today to discuss. Um, and there's more discussion of these concepts in the intro to this um, news kit, this paper that we at Deepin have published, and you can go and take a look at it. What is exactly this proposal, local news dollars? This is a way to fund local news via individual choices. <clears throat> um, in other words, governments, state governments in this case, give money um, to individuals as in the form of vouchers or news dollars, and then individuals make decisions about where to allocate those funds, which news outlets to fund. Um, some details that are in this kit include a whole bunch of different ways to structure this with paywalls, without paywalls, funding outlets that um, encouraging outlets that are for profit, encouraging outlets maybe that are just only nonprofits, um, ways to ensure many outlets and spread the money around, ensure diversity of outlets with caps, and other things like how um, outlets can be encouraged or required to disclose things like ownership funding, how they're spending money, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of different options and details are presented in the, in the paper, and we're happy to take questions about that. Okay. Um, this kind of system, I want to underline here, <clears throat> is a way to fund news with individual choices in the sense that uh, another way to say that is that it's content neutral. The government, this, is, this is, of course, critical that governments and politicians are not making decisions about which outlets receive money. Individuals are doing that. Um, the government is staying out of content decisions. And this is consistent with the First Amendment. So the First Amendment <clears throat> is, um, you know, admits this sort of funding for public journalism, as happens um, at other, you know, uh, as has happened at other points in U.S. history. And we can talk. Uh, I will talk more about that in a second. Um, one highlight here is uh, a book in a book um, that. Uh, Martha Minow wrote in 2021, she says, the First Amendment forbids viewpoint discrimination on the use of public funds for journalism. So, um, you know, we, this is a system that does not discriminate at, with respect to viewpoint. Individuals are making de decisions about where the money goes. Okay. Um, one thing I want to touch on here is something something relatively specific. So people often, when they hear this kind of proposal, come back to us and say, um, well, um, isn't this going to just make uh, news bubbles worse? And I want to just take a second to address that. I think that the current journalism crisis is really creates or arises from a lack of information. The problem is not just news bubbles. There's already opportunity. There's already money to fund the kind of news or information that lots of big that that big money interests are interested in. And we've seen lots of examples of that arise over the past couple of years. We've seen local fake fake news outlets, and we've seen um, corporate funded sort of local news imitation outlets arriving in areas where local news has declined. Um, at the same time entertainment and national news has really come in and filled the gaps that have occurred as local as, as local journalism, journalism for broad audience, your local newspaper that used to go to many people living in a local area, as those have shrunk, national news has really risen. And so I think local news funding, public funding solutions really should be seen as a way to sort of lift all boats. We're gonna create lots of different kinds of content to reach lots of different kinds of audiences and really um, you know, lift all boats to improve public debate. Okay, I want to touch on one thing about history, and then I will I will finish. 
the, the U.S. used to fund journalism with public dollars. So this is not something that's new in our history. In the 1800s, the U.S. government spent an estimated 0.2% of GDP, that's $46 billion in today's economy, to subsidize news. And that happened through a postal service subsidy in which newspapers, which were one of the major things that were distributed through the post office, um, it was the main way that, that newspapers were distributed, were given preferential postage rates. And so this kind of subsidy, um, you know, boosted lots of different kinds of newspapers at, uh, you know, at this point in our history. And a second point of comparison is to other democracies. So democracies from Norway to Germany to the UK to Japan spend 50 to $150 per capita to fund journalism. This is from Victor Pickard and um, Tim Neff. The U.S. spends, in contrast, on direct public funding less than two dollars. And so here's the chart from their paper um, of the various of different countries and how much they directly spend on public funding. Here's the U.S. We can, you know, barely see it. Maybe it's not surprising we have we have, we have a failure of local journalism in this case. All right. So where did this proposal come from? And then I'll finish. So Dean Baker, who we're lucky to have with us today, was one of, if not the first person to write about this, this or to propose this idea in 2003. In this um, article I've cited, he went on to write a book about a larger version of this proposal. Um, this was then picked up and elaborated on by Bob McChesney and John Nichols. Um, Ezra Klein wrote about it in 2009, and they published a book in 2010. Um, recently, we've had a, sort of other interests from other sources. I've listed a couple, uh, a couple of those sources here. You can go to our document on the web um, for more references. And what's also happened lately is that there's, there's been sort of a policy proof of principle that the Seattle Democracy Voucher Program. So they have, so Seattle has implemented a uh, a um, public support system for. Um, political races in which individuals are given vouchers and they give them to candidates. This is a way to you know, fund those races. And a lot of things I think are, have, are really learnable from that system in terms of the details on how to implement a news dollar or a news voucher system. And then finally, a couple of years ago, another person that we have with us, Marcus Green, wrote an article about how specifically exactly this idea, the democracy, the Seattle democracy voucher system could be implemented to fund news in the Seattle area where he lives and publishes in his paper. All right, so that's all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. Um, I hope that's an, uh, I hope that is a bit of a start in the intro. We're happy to take questions either here or offline. Feel free to get in touch and the, um, the article is online. Thank you very much. Back to you, Pete. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, please continue dropping questions in the chat. We're gonna take them for the Q&A at the end after all four speakers have spoken. And what Mark said at the end is really important to how we work with Deepin, which is these are all just buffets of ideas here in these one hour conversations. The real magic is what happens when you contact us afterwards, contact one of the experts um, about how you can champion this in your state. So Mark's being really serious when he says, please reach out afterwards because we wanna help you bring local news dollars or some form of it to your state. Um, so let's go to our second speaker today um, who has had experience fighting for public journalism support uh, in states in California, uh, Media and Democracy Program Manager at California Common Cause, Maya Chupkov. Over to you, Maya. Hello, everyone. Um... It's lovely to see all of you and so much representation from across the country, including California, which is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so um, I, I started with California Common Cause a little over a year and a half ago. We are a um, national organization that um, does public policy advocacy around democracy issues. So I am part of the California team and the media and democracy program is one of our newest policy areas. And so my role is to fight um, for public interest journalism policies. Um, and so um, you'll see this slide. The these are just several of the different types of policies out there around su supporting local journalism. Um, I'm not gonna go in depth on all of them, 
but on a, a few of them, I'm going to first start with the local news fellowship program, because this applies directly with what California was able to pass during last year's legislative cycle. Um, so I was part of a California working group of both publishers and a democracy organizations um, that really wanted to pass a statewide bill that would help support local journalism. Um, we were just su surprised to find out that Se Senator Glazer, um, he in introduced a bill last year and it kind of snuck up on us. We didn't know about it. So um, our group kind of came together and said, okay, let's work on this bill together. And so one of the things that really helps with a successful local journalism policy is having a very passionate sponsor or author. Um, so that was a big part of the reason why we were able to successfully pass this issue is because the, the the senator was very committed to passing this. And so um, long story short, we went back and forth on the, the, the bill and our first vision didn't end up happening the way we thought, but we were able to help um, get $20 million to a local news fellowship program out of UC of Berkeley. And right now um, that money is be, being spent. The first um, the first fellowship orientation is going to take place this fall. So um, and it's going to be a three year um, fellowship program. So we, we will be closely monitoring it and seeing um, how it can be improved. Um, and, and I'm happy to answer more about that in the Q&A. Um, the second um, policy I'll talk about is um, community-specific media grant programs. This was actually the first idea we wanted um, to, to happen when we were speaking with Senator Glazer. Um, one of the, the biggest issues, though, that we were that we were um kind of getting in the 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 weeds about is how to define local journalism so um that um we ended up not coming to a consensus on that um it was uh, a really tight crunch at the end and we were able we were forced to have to like make all these decisions last minute. And at the end of the time, we just didn't feel comfortable with the definition. So um, that's when the local news fellowship program was born. Um, new Mexico actually was the brainchild of this, of this policy and initiative. They just passed um, their own lo local news fellowship from um, that the state is funding and I believe Washington also um, has one as well. So um, those are two um, very active policy solutions moving through different states. Um, the third one is information di districts, which um, I actually saw that Simon is in the audience. So I'm sure he he can speak to um, that policy solution way more. The, than, than me, but um, to quickly summarize it, um, it's it it's um, so a, a inf information district um, are established de democratically, funded by a local tax, and to prevent political interference, it's governed by an independent public board that is accountable to the community they serve. Um, so a, so the, uh, um, a, a very similar model can, can be like a library di di district where um, a local library is funded um, by a, a local tax. Um, and then the fourth one is an advertising set aside. And actually I am working with a coalition in San Francisco 
to get a advertising set aside done in the city of San Francisco. Um, what an advertising set aside would do, um, at least in our model, is it will require local government agencies and departments to spend at least 50% of existing ad advertising dollars on community spe specific media. Um, so that was successfully done in New York City, and they saw amazing impacts from that. Um, and now I think the state of Connecticut is trying to do that as well statewide. So that policy is also ga ga gaining a lot of traction as well. Um, and the last um, solution that um, hasn't quite been successful yet is the journalism tax credits. Um, and what this would um, do is um, it would be a jour journalism tax credit um, for either the, the newsroom, um, the employees, or there's a, a, a bunch of diff different ways to, to, to do, do that. And I'm happy to answer that in the Q&A &A as well. Um, and then I'm just gonna quickly pivot um, before I end to a snapshot of some of the things we're doing in the Bay Area. Um, I'm not going to go into e each one, but this just gives you a snapshot of kind of what's going on. Um, we find it really hard to um, pass policies statewide. So we're really, fo we're really fo focusing right now on city specific and regional specific so solutions. And then the last thing to I'll mention is we are monitoring two statewide bills in California. Um, we haven't taken a position on e either of these yet, um, especially around AB 886. There are a lot of concerns coming from the local um, news publishers that this will mostly benefit national publications and not smaller community specific media. So we are analyzing that closely. Um, and yeah, and um, I just wanted to give, give you guys a heads up. I've been stuttering a lot be because I'm just like having a stuttering episode. I have a stutter, it's a speech impediment. St stuttering Awareness Week is next week. So just shouting out all the people who stutter out there. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of note that I'm having like a stuttering thing um, where I'm st stuttering more than than, than you usual. So just wanted to f flag that as an awareness thing. But yeah, that's all for, 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 from me. And I'm happy to answer anything in more depth in the Q&A. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Maya. There were already questions dropping in into the chat. Um, we will get to them at the end when we get to um, our next two speakers, or if any of the experts want to chime in in the chat to share text as well. So appreciate your wonderful work in California, Maya. We move on to our third speaker today, uh, the publisher of the South Seattle Emerald and a columnist with the Seattle Times uh, and a resident of a place that has a voucher system for campaign finance that could be a model for journalism as well. So over to you, Marcus Green. All right, thank you so much, Pete. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Marcus Harrison Green. Uh, I founded the South Seattle Emerald, uh, a nonprofit uh, newspaper about 10 years ago. Uh, my parents will say that I foolishly left a lucrative career in high finance to essentially go into public service, something I'm sure many folks on this, uh, on this call today can relate to. Um, I'm again also a columnist with the Seattle Times, and uh, by way of inclusion, uh, for anyone who may be visually impaired, I'm a, a black man with black hair who is wearing a green shirt. And I've also been told that I look like a younger, more handsome looking Denzel Washington, but that's, I guess, up for subjective debate. Uh, all that being said, um, without having prior knowledge uh, uh, about the idea of local news dollars, I wrote about the concept uh, four years ago in one of my columns. Uh, at the time, several local publications had recently 
shuttered their doors and my own publication was hanging on by uh, a thread. Um, it just so happened that my publication had a striking resemblance uh, to the others that were either struggling to survive or had gone defunct, uh, meaning it primarily served our city's communities of color as well as, well as our city's low income residents. Uh, for instance, some of the areas that we covered had residents with median incomes of less than $25,000 a year. Uh, for context, that's in a city where $80,000 a year is considered to be scraping by. Um, I actually uh, grew up in one of those areas, uh, which is why I know firsthand how much they needed a news source that was accurate, informative, and timely. Uh, but I also knew that with limited disposable income, those areas couldn't always afford to pay for uh, for that coverage, but all, which also meant that publications like mine were always dealing with financial precarity um, in order to serve that readership, as uh, Mark uh, laid out earlier. Um, and I will say, in, in media driven by financial bottom lines, uh, there is rarely an economic incentive to serve those communities, uh, communities that I've seen um, slowly turn into news deserts. Uh, not only that, but I believe that market-driven media often preys upon the worst instincts of our human nature. Uh, that type of media would rather stimulate than educate and enrage rather than, than inform. And I think that's true regardless of what side of the political aisle you find yourself uh, on, whether it's the, the MSNBCs or Fox News of the world. Uh, it, it's why I actually look at Seattle's Democracy Voucher Program as a model for how we might halt the tendency for media to lean into the sensational uh, rather than the explanatory. I also believe it's a public solution, much like the post office, that can serve areas that are too costly for commercial businesses to serve. Uh, in my city, the Democracy Voucher Program's main objective is to neutralize the role of big money in our local elections by providing public financing for citywide elections. Um, each resident is given $25 coupons that they can in turn donate to the candidate of their choice. And over the last four years, the program has produced an 86% increase in the number of candidates running for office. It's also given Seattle the distinction of having the biggest and most diverse donor pool in the nation. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the program has also produced a sound model for how to save journalism, uh, the state of which remains dire. Nationally, media job cuts jumped 20% last year, and a report by Georgetown University's Center of Education and Workforce found that more than a third of journalism jobs will be lost by 2031. Uh, since the pandemic began, we've also lost more than 360 papers, amounting to about two closures per week. It's been said before, and it should be noted that, of course, journalism is the only legal institution um, listed, listed in our constitution. Um, and I can't overstate the importance of journalism to our society. It is the great leveler of power, putting the rich on the same floor as the poor. And yes, its goal is to speak truth to power, but more importantly for me, its goal is to speak truth to those who are led to believe that they are powerless. Journalism reminds them, journalism at its best, I should say, reminds those people that they are not powerless. I'm reminded of that every day uh, when I think of a young black man named Andre, who I interviewed in one of my first assignments as a journalist. I was tasked with asking people in the South Seattle community what they loved about their community. And he told me nothing when I asked him. He said it's because people like me, uh, meaning the media, had told him via their broadcasts and their stories that he and the people like him in his community that they were savages, that they were criminals, that they were thugs, and that's all his community ever produced. Um, I thought very little of it at the time um, as I went on to interview other people. Uh, but two weeks later, the young man uh, was found uh, not too far away from where I interviewed him. He was found dead in the driver's seat of uh, a car with a bullet in his chest and a gun in his hand. And, uh, to this day, I always think about what if there were stories that affirmed his life, that showed him what he could become and presented his community not as a stereotype, but in a fully rendered humanity. Everyone 
everywhere, every citizen in this country, regardless of their economic means, background, race, or organization, deserves media that is multidimensional, humanizing, and tells an authentic story of the community it purports to cover. I believe that news dollars can and will provide this. So I very much appreciate the privilege of your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus. So appreciate you bringing, you know, showing that the rubber hits the road on this, that it's not just a wonky set of policies to kind of help one sector of the economy. It's a very significant aspect that is a community pillar um, that can be one of the foundations of a flourishing uh, uh, democracy in a locale. So, so appreciate that, Marcus. To our final speaker today, we move to our senior economist at the Center for Economic and Policy Research, uh, Dean Baker. Sweet. Um, thanks. I really appreciate being included in this. And I have to say, I'm not someone who has their feet on the ground. I'm an academic or, you know, uh, whatever think tank person. But I want to say a little bit about how I, I see this. And I, I think this effort's tremendously important. I'll confess, I'm on Twitter, and I endlessly see, see people going on about billionaires and how much money Elon Musk has and this and that. And, you know, I go, okay, uh, that's good, but what are you going to do about it? And, and I remember actually a New York Times columnist said, oh, I can't believe no one's done anything about billionaires. Well, who did you expect to do what? And it's 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 really kind of painful. Um, some of you may, you maybe have read or heard of Thomas Piketty's great book, Capital in 21st Century, great book. His answer to growing inequality, a wealth tax. Okay, dream on. You know, when are we going to, you know, so so it's it's a little, you know, disconcerting to me seeing, you know, people upset appropriately, but utterly lost on any solutions. And what strikes me is I've had occasion to deal with the right. They've been very effective in finding solutions, unfortunately. Um, back in the 90s, I was debating constantly on Social Security. And the people I was debating, not one person ever said they wanted to get rid of Social Security. It was always, they want to give people a choice. Go, okay, well, let's try and give people a choice. Well, their choice, you know, if you thought about it a minute, and I did, was always a method that would ultimately destroy Social Security. And I won't go into details. If people are interested, I can give it to you. But they, they've done that. They do that again and again and again. They slipped a provision in the tax code in the late 70s that destroyed traditional defined benefit pensions, a tiny provision. I think most Democrats actually support it. You, you've all heard of it. 401ks. Okay, That destroyed defined benefit pensions. Did the same thing with Medicare. Most people in Medicare are not in the traditional Medicare program. They're uh, Medicare Advantage. They give money to insurers. The right has been very, very effective in getting their nose under the tent and basically destroying things that we really care about. I want us to think like the right. Okay, we have to think that way. And that's why I love, you know, this effort here. You know, who knows exactly what will come of it, how these things will be shaped. But to my view, this is the route we have to go. So I'm going to argue about the tax credit system. I think that is the best route. Um, it shouldn't be alien. Um, what I see as the model here is the uh, the tax credit for charitable contributions. You know, people go, oh, you want to give everyone $100 to give to, you know, journalism of their choice, whatever. Well, if I'm a rich person and I give $100 million, the government's going to give me back $40 million of that. Okay, so don't tell me you're upset about the government giving money to, you know, I like this journalist or this newspaper. We have a charitable tax deduction. I'm a rich person. I gave $100 million to some right-wing think tank. Well, the government's picking up $40 million of that. So the idea that somehow this is some alien concept, you know, we'd be doing a weird thing. No, we're doing that now in a much bigger way, except it's hugely tilted towards the rich. Most of us take the standard deduction. We don't get a penny out of it. But obviously, even if we did, you know, if we gave $1,000, most of us aren't in the 40% bracket, and we certainly can't give $100 million, most of us. So, you know, so it's not an alien concept. Also, the idea of a subsidy, you know, I, I say this to people that get angry at me. Copyright is quite explicitly a subsidy. Read the Constitution. I don't know how many times I've talked about, because I like to see this as an alternative to copyright, and people say copyright's in the Constitution. Go read it. Read where it's appeared. It, it's quite explicitly a subsidy in order to promote useful arts and sciences. It's quite explicitly serve a public purpose. It's right there next to the power to tax, power to declare war. It's a power of Congress. It's not in the Bill of Rights. Okay, it's a way to promote creative work. 
good, you know, you could argue about the merits, but that's that's the point of it, to promote creative work. So this is an alternative. So again, I would hold up the IRS uh, uh, tax deduction for charitable contributions as a model. Um, and again, you know, how are we going to decide who's a journalist? You know, what qualifies? That's going to be problematic, but much less so. You know, again, we have a lot of dubious charities that get millions and millions and millions of tax deductions. So I would just say, you know, I recognize the problem. We all have to recognize the problem. But the idea that someone's going to say, oh, I'm a journalist. And then you look at what they're doing. Oh, you're not really a journalist or you're not doing local. I, I think that's really a very, very secondary concern. You know, again, no one's, at least to my knowledge, has proposed getting rid of the charitable tax deduction because, you know, frankly, some of the people that benefit are frauds. You know, again, you try to minimize the fraud, but there will be fraud. There, anything, anything you have, there'll be fraud. Take that as a given. Okay, and my, my idea is that, you know, if you give it out, the condition is that you don't get copyright protection. So it's it's in the public domain. So, you know, again, I realize that would create some issues, you know, but again, I think that's appropriate. If, if, if a newspaper that says, no, we want to have our paywall, uh, my view is go, good for you, but you're not getting the money. You know, your competitors will get the money. You know, and the idea is that you have a lot of work that would be in the public domain for everyone to, to get. Now, again, thinking of how can you make this a feasible route to go? Uh, again, you know, I, uh, Mark gave the number of this, the value of the subsidy, and it's not wrong that it would be around 40 billion a year. I think it actually would be a little higher if we adjust for GDP today, but it doesn't matter. That's a lot of money. <laughs> We're not about to get that. But, you know, again, thinking foot in the door. So the Seattle Democracy Vouchers, I think, is a fantastic example. I, I think Marcus actually undersold it. I get a big kick out of it. You have a socialist. I told a friend of mine, you have a socialist, and he goes, oh, big deal. I go, no, no, no. I mean a socialist, like the real thing, like a Marx-Lenin socialist, not a DSA left liberal. Real. I mean, you could agree or disagree with her. I don't care, you know, but but the point is you don't have that anywhere else, you know. So that that's that's the advantage of those democracy vouchers. So to my view, you know, that's a fantastic system, fantastic model. How could you make that work for journalism? Well, you know, the democracy vouchers, I think they limit the number of people that could take advantage of it to make sure it doesn't cost too much. But in any case, the city's able to afford it. But suppose you said a city like Seattle that, you know, you could give 100,000 people 100 bucks each, again, argue about the numbers, but, you know, just doing the arithmetic, that's that's 10 million bucks. Could Seattle afford that? I think probably, you know, will they? I don't know. But, you know, the point is make it doable. The other part of the story is, there are foundations that are ostensibly committed to, to, to journalism, promoting journalism. So suppose Seattle could get a matching commitment that if they put up five million, you'd get, I don't know, would the Knight Reader Foundation put up five million? I don't know. But in principle, you have foundations that care about journalism. They could match that. And again, the whole idea is a foot in the door. We don't envision, a, I don't think anyone seriously envisions a foundation playing a major role in sustaining journalism in the United States. But to get a foot in the door, I think that's a possibility. So long and short, I think this is a proposal that has tremendous potential. Again, it, it could be cut and diced a thousand different ways. I don't think anyone should get caught up on the particulars. The point is to get the foot in the door, show it could be done, show it could be a model. And if people like it, they'll build on it. So I'll shut up with that. Thank you so, so much, Dean. And thank you to all the speakers. We're going to move on to Q&A. We're going to do Q&A for about 15 minutes, and then we're going to end with a pop-up poll that will allow you to sign up for a working group which basically serves an e as an email list to ask questions to these experts to find out updates as you know public funding of news comes along so stick around for that we'll start with the q a for 15 minutes one of the questions that came through i'll throw this to mark is how could local news dollars support communities without existing news outlets. So this is an interesting question where, you know, you get a dollar that you could, you know, local news voucher that you can spend on um, outlets, but there's no outlets in your neighborhood. So how can it support that? More over to you, Mark. Yeah, I mean, one thing that states can do in this circumstance is, is build ways to nurture new outlets, right? I think that one of the things that states should be doing if they're going to um, implement a proposal like this is um, create ways to nurture and incubate news outlets. And there's tons of models for that from, you know, small business administration to other forms of, you know, uh, nurturing new uh, uh, startup entities in various lo locales. Did yeah. I answer the question? 
I, I think that covers it. And, and it's interesting because these things work dynamically. Suddenly you have a thousand people in a neighborhood that never would have had the extra spending, you know, disposable income to subscribe to a newspaper. So no one in the neighborhood starts thinking I'm going to launch a newspaper, but suddenly you have a thousand people and that's a hundred thousand dollars worth of vouchers. And someone starts thinking maybe not the first cycle because they're not a newspaper yet, but maybe they start thinking maybe the next cycle I could do a voucher fundraising campaign. Um, so there's something there. We got a question through that said, um, uh, how would we navigate the optics and the messaging challenge of some of these funding models? NPR thought government funded Twitter tag was so toxic they abandoned the platform. Um, so, you know, how do we overcome the stigma of government funded media? Though I will note that local news dollars has this benefit that it's not government workers deciding who gets the money, it's giving you the money to decide what you want, but still a question of public funded journalism stigma. Maya or Marcus, do you have anything you want to share on that, given your support for public support for journalism? Yeah, I mean, I would say that um, the the business model that a lot of um, a lot of our commercial news outlets rest on um, it's it's not sustainable, and while philanthropy is, you know, uh, evolving to so, so support more lo local journalism. It's not enough to really sustain um, the wide variety of local journalism that um, we're just seeing. And so we, we need to think about how public policy can really help support local news media. Um, and that doesn't mean that we need to risk, um, you know, we we can create policy that has these safeguards in place to, to make sure there is that, that separation between um, the government and the local news. Um, that was one of the stickiest points of our work working on our bill last year with Senator Glazer is how can we set up a program that is as independent from government as possible. Um, and a really good model is New York, New Jer Jersey's Civic Information Consortium. They have an independent 501c3 board um, that, um, that handles and goes through the grant applications for their Community specific grants program, and they they do a great job of making sure that there are safeguards in place. So it is possible. It just um, it really t takes a lot of um, a lot of collaboration with both the um, the policymakers and the the um, the lo the lo lo the lo local media. Thank yeah, you, Maya. I, Marcus, yeah, I was going to throw it to you. Sorry, yeah, and Pete, I, I would just add, I think that there's, uh, and, and I say this as somebody who's a clear, bleeding heart liberal who loves NPR, uh, but I think there's a, you know, delineation between, you know, government funding going directly to one source and this being more, we, we talk about messaging, this is more of a participatory, um, participatory budgeting, um, you, you might say, uh, uh, um, scheme, if you will, in the sense that if, for instance, you know, if, if this were to, to take place in Seattle, um, you know, if you can, and if you're somebody who's conservative or right of center, you'd be able to, you know, give your voucher to whatever you would think, um, you know, whatever publication you would feel um, sort of aligned with that values, as, as you would if you were a socialist, as you would if you were um, a liberal or, or anarchist or, or what have you. So I, I think that there is more, much more um, autocracy, you might say, and, and decision making um, that it that this allows in terms of what media is supported, um, you know, then, you know, just simply, you know, a public financing model that would go to, um, you know, to a, a, you know, one either regional or national source. If, if I could jump in quickly, I, I think it's also, you know, again, I read the point about the charitable deduction, um, uh, tax tax deduction. 
no one, I think we have a problem with that. I think we should, we have to talk more about that in the sense that that is a government subsidy. And, you know, I know there's this idea, no, that's my money. I made a hundred million dollars. And if I want to give 10 million to, you know, whatever it is, that's my money. And of course I shouldn't pay taxes on it. And I think it's really important to hit back on that. We, you, you made a hundred million dollars. Your tax bill is, you know, 35 million. I'm pulling numbers somewhat out of the air. I mean, ballpark. If, if we're going to give you a tax deduction from that, that's the public's money. So, you know, if we're going to call, you know, someone who gets the gov the, the, the media vouchers government funded, well, then we should call the churches that get charitable tax deductions government funded. We don't. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, we, we have to keep throwing that in their face because they don't get to define the terms. Back to you, Mark. Um, yeah, I just add that what I saw about this NPR situation was significant pushback. I mean, I thought there was a good discussion from the BBC and others in talking about journalistic firewalls and how there was public support that allowed them to do their journalism, but they were editorially, you know, that, you know, there was editorial independence. And I think that's another thing is, you know, re relating to what Dean is saying to push back on and talk about how, um, you know, these are independent outlets that are government supported. One we can win that. Wonderful. One more question before we move to the poll and uh, get in everyone signed up for the working group who's interested, uh, email list. Um, a little bit on tactics. So I've always thought, you know, some of the, there's a good person in your, there's a good sector in your corner when you're pushing for public funding of journalism, which is all the local newspapers that do exist. Probably, you know, many of them might want public funding, not guaranteed, but many of the smaller ones might. Um, who else, you know, Maya, in your experience in California, what is the coalition that comes together to fight for this? We, you know, people in the audience right now were invited because they want to champion policies like this in their state. How should they start thinking when it comes to strategy and tactics? Yeah, it's going to be different depending. So if we're talking about statewide, that's very, um, tricky, especially if there isn't an existing coalition in place. And what we've experienced here in California is the larger publishers have a big voice in, in Sacramento. And so um, it's, it's really hard to balance that voice with those that are um, ser serving smaller communities. Um, and so the most important thing is starting to really build a coalition that includes like ethnic media, that includes really like these more niche outlets that we need more of. Um, and we and what I experienced doing it statewide is it's it it's really hard to start statewide. So that's why we're kind of shifting to to a boat to focusing on cities and regions because California is a huge state. And so starting small and starting those smaller coalitions in communities is such a great tactic because then that can lead to more coalitions in other communities. And then eventually you can combine all of those together. So depending on what state you're operating in, you really have to kind of think about what would be most strategic. If it's a smaller state, then, then it might be more feasible. But with a state like ours, it's just you kind of have to start at the very local level in my, in my experience. And Mark, from what you've seen at the national level, you've been in talks with you know, the folks that were pushing public funding or public support in Congress. Um, what have you learned about strategy and writing this kit and talking to all the people that have been pushing for this? I think we've just heard a lot of it today about, I think what Maya is saying is really right on that starting with um, local coalitions and building from outlets that, you know, as Marcus also said, outlets that are having trouble um, you know, appealing to audiences that are not um, from wealthy demographics, right? I mean, that's the, those are the audiences that are really going to benefit from these kind of um, 
from from um, support, from public support for news. And I think those are the coalitions that you can build as we've heard here today. That seeing no more questions in the chat, I just want to give our speakers any final thoughts, anyone that they uh, want to share that they weren't you weren't asked about, but you want to make sure an audience of state and city champions might be uh, good for them to hear. Any final word? Okay, seeing none. Um, thank you, everyone. We're going to, okay, popping up right now on the screen is a poll should be going up. Um, Mike Draskovich is here who runs all the back end logistics for all of this. So he's the one to thank for this great event. Um, and basically the question that's popping up is, are you interested in championing this policy? If you are, um, we'll add you to this list of people interested in championing, make it easier for you to get answers, get updates, you know, get what you need to start championing this. If you're not ready, but you wanna stay in the loop, we'll get you on that group too. And hopefully you're not in the third category, but feel free to click that too. If you're not interested in uh, public funding of journalism after this event, um, that's option three. But um, hopefully one and two after this amazing uh, information we've gotten from these great speakers. Thank you so much for those, um, all of these, we're gonna be set, posting the video later. We're gonna send out contact information for all of our speakers. You can check out Mark's amazing kit on local news dollars at democracypolicy.network slash local news dollars. Um, and we hope to see uh, bills and programs for championing public support of news coming out of your cities and states in the year, months and years ahead. So thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate you all fighting for a deeper democracy.